Hi everyone, welcome to another of our Artemis Live interviews and today I'm delighted to speak with James Poole, founder and managing director of Agile Risk Partners. So James and his business partners launched Agile as a pure risk advisory, bringing together broking expertise and understanding of insurer and reinsurer capital pressures, all together with technology to try and deliver a lower total cost of risk for their clients. And recently, James let me know that Agile has secured risk capital from a number of hedge fund investors, amounting to $250 million, and is now looking to secure opportunities to deploy that capital on a collateralized basis into what they are terming special reinsurance situations. So with a maximum of 30 million deployable into any single opportunity, Agile's hoping to build a diversified portfolio of really interesting risk opportunities for its investors while helping students to reduce their cost of risk at the same time. And so I thought a discussion was warranted. So James, thanks for joining me today. Nice to see you. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, it's, it's great to be uh, great to be virtually with you. And I've, I've seen a number of your other videos. So uh, there's, there's, a, there's a high bar to to be cleared here <laughs> absolutely we're, we're trying to raise that bar every time so i'm expecting a lot <laughs> okay. so to begin i guess uh, maybe maybe you could tell us a little about your sort of total cost of risk theory and why you launched agile as a risk advisory rather than opting to be a broker or an underwriter yeah we we think about creative value more specifically creating value for for clients by by thinking about total cost of risk on one hand and risk adjusted returns on capital on the other and these these are as far as we could say first principles um but but to, in order to answer your question I'll, i'm going to sort of look at it in reverse if that's okay and start with our business is that is that okay sure sure um i mean the purpose of a business per se is to create something or to make a difference or move something forward right uh, and the purpose of our business is to is to lead profound sustainable change in global reinsurance markets. Um, and we're gonna do that by pioneering the first sessions of uh, facultative reinsurance risk uh, to, to capital markets. So collateralized facultative reinsurance. I mean, it's three words, so it should be fairly straightforward, and, right? But, but it's also 13 syllables. And that, that is the, the, the translation exercise is, is the big challenge between insurance capital markets or has been here too for this this category um and back to first principles uh total cost of risk and uh risk adjusted returns of capital we believe that as 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 a buyer every every buyer uh their objective is to minimize and reduce total cost of risk yeah, the they, total cost of risk being the the present value of the sum of all cash flows for for retaining risk for investing in the prevention of risk and then also for transferring risk um interestingly in this marketplace everyone's a buyer because they all have uh households and car insurance and uh various home uh insurances as well as being suppliers of capital in other contexts too um so the the other thing to the, the other key to look at is the other universal, the other axiom is, is creating value for capital providers by generating risk adjusted returns on capital, which are higher than cost of capital. So um, we, Warren Buffett sort of bleats on about this for, for weeks on YouTube videos. And uh, it's, it's, a real, it's a real first principle as, we're, as far as we're concerned. And we, we're using, collateralized facultative reinsurance to do two things therefore so one is uh, to reduce the total cost of risk for for buyers for cedents and for the clients of brokers uh, and the second is to generate risk adjusted returns on capital for providers of capital partners that we're working with to, to finance risks differently um, is that okay right yeah no that, that's, that's very interesting it's a different different proposition to the majority of the ILS market as well which makes it particularly interesting to me and um, you speak to a lot of the things that I believe in in the industry around trying to do something different as well and um, and focusing on cost of capital and providing providing the returns people want and making it all efficient is um, is really important um so you've been referring to your fund or or pool of capital and the risk that you're going to write underneath it as a special reinsurance situations fund can you perhaps define what you mean by that a little bit? And maybe you could also expand on 
collateralized facultative reinsurance as well because i'm sure there'll be a few people watching who won't understand that the, the three words and 13 syllables yeah sure yeah um, most, most ILS strategies as, as far as it appears to us are supply side led supply side oriented and this is understandable i guess because uh, at the beginning of uh, collateralized reinsurance began in treaty reinsurance markets where it's all about supply of capital to portfolios of risk and also to it to insurance teams to distribute through uh, insurance uh, channels now we're, we're looking at things in a slightly different way um, that's driven by the fact that we are we've, we've grown up in the gutters of ec3 in the london facultative markets but but we we're, we're, we're we put together this risk advisory team, which is, which means we're absolutely not fund managers, and neither are we agents of uh, risk capital or the hedge funds that we work with. But we're the risk advisory team that has identified specific customer segments uh, with with a problem, with a insurance or reinsurance problem. Uh, we're calling this strategy special reinsurance situations, and the exposures are that are in scope for this are a large corporate risks with large claims in recent years, which are a challenge or impossible to insure by traditional insurers given high levels of dislocation, profitability issues and uh, solvency to pressures. So we are agile insofar as we're able to point any kind of underlying insurable risk exposure at this fund. Um, we have picked a very small proof of concept uh, and and problematic customer segment to, to start with. But yeah, we, we look forward to uh, to scaling this. So really the differences, I guess, Steve, between collateralized facultative reinsurance and collateralized treaty reinsurance, which some people refer to as cap bonds, is the, is the nature of the underlying. So in facultative risk, we're talking about large corporates that may present many thousands of locations or underlying risk exposures to insurers and then capital providers, but there's a single corporate entity and principle. Uh, in, in the case of treaty reinsurance, you're really rather pro providing a mandate to an insurer to go out and find, originate, execute on deals that qualify by, with some kind of geographical scope. The, the, the facultative risk, because it's, uh, we're further down the, the value chain, um, enables people to get a bit closer to the risk and there are benefits associated with that too. Mm. It's also interesting as to where you could potentially source those risks from as well, because I know, I know a lot of corporates obviously struggle to cover all of their exposure anyway. Sometimes the market just can't provide the capital that they might need. Um, but also a lot of them are putting these types of risks into their captives too, which isn't always as efficient or effective as they perhaps think it is from an accountancy point of view. Um, well, but from a risk point of view, it's not. It, it, it's a a captive is a it's a structure that has been around for some time, and it's an it's a very good structure for managing difficulties uh, in risk transfer requirements and arrangements. Uh, dislocation of of markets can be catered for. We can have a look at the the. The, the total cost of risk uh, retained within a corporate uh, balance sheet uh, using using a captive and, and compare that against the equivalent um, rate online associated with, with transferring that risk exposure too. So captives are excellent tools for, for this. And they're not, this is not a, they're not mutually exclusive. In, in some cases we're, we're working with uh, corporate buyers of reinsurance for, for their captive. So we're providing uh, a cell structure within a protected cell captive, or as the chaps on Bermuda in long socks and, and shorts call it, a segregated account captive. And um, these, are, these, are, these are structures where we are uh, providing financing or providing capacity or risk capital to an existing captive. So two captives coming together, the two are not mutually exclusive. Yeah, interesting. And so why do you think these opportunities are going to be attractive to investors and also suited to writing on a collateralized basis? Well, in principle, Steve, we, we think the facultative business is more suitable to collateralization than treaty reinsurance business. Um, uh, 
for three reasons, really. I mean, you're, you're one step closer to the buyer, and this gives you more visibility of the underlying risk exposures. Um, you under, specifically, by that, I mean, you have specific addresses for with, with asset values attached prior to inception, which you wouldn't necessarily have in a cap bond structure where you're just providing a mandate to an insurer team. Um, the, the, because of the reduction in the value chain, uh, the so-called value chain, uh, there are a few mouths to feed. Um, we, we're bringing capital, risk capital providers one step further forward in the uh, long and arduous reinsurance value chain. And there's also less execution risk because if you uh, if if you look at facultative risk insurance, you're you you can target actual customer segments and actual customer risk problems and exposures rather than just insurers' plans to insure them. So there's perhaps a re reduced execution risk implication there too. And having greater clarity about underlying assets means you can be more deliberate about the way that you build a portfolio. Uh, and primary facultative reinsurance is, is priced far, high, far higher than a typical cap bond, which means that investors' downsides can be more limited as well. Mm. I suppose there's also an interesting opportunity to be a niche specialist in this space as well, because um, you really need to understand those individual risks too. So much of this, this business is about learning new languages. So mm. we have... Uh, I, my my journey so far has required me to learn a new language of capital. So I spent an inordinate number of Saturday mornings reading corporate finance textbooks from the Open University in my MBA uh, to get give me a better understanding about the, the language of capital. You know, the, then the next I I have been working for the last sort of five or so years in various guises in in startup and early venture businesses because I thought that it was really important to, to understand the language of entrepreneurship like I think you can really kind of grasp that but you don't necessarily really understand it unless you've been working in uh, startups and early venture businesses so prior to starting Agile as Partners I, I did that then, then you've got the, the the language of data science the, uh, the, the challenge one challenge for the insurance sector is uh, a supposed lack of data. Although this data does exist, it's maybe more a challenge of asking the right questions. But once you have that, um, using analytics to understand that data, navigate and understand exposures better is, is the challenge. So I've been learning the language of R, um, which is a comparator to Python, um, useful for uh, data analytics. So, so that's been another language that... I've been learning. Um, a, a fourth interest to me, uh, because I've seen challenging profitability problems around the insurance market, um, is the language of business turnaround. So I've been um, working really hard in the last few years to get a better understanding of, of, the, of that language to, to aid me in, 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 uh, in, in what we're doing too. Interesting. Yeah. So this sounds like it, I mean, it aligns with a lot of what we end up writing about and trying to get risk capital up front and reduce the number of mouths to feed in the chain. And the capital markets are eminently suitable to take on some of these larger risks and things like that. So do you think this is, I mean, it's something that's been building ever since, if we go back to 1997, when Tokyo Disneyland did a parametric cap bond, it's um, it's like that was a large facultative transaction, yeah. really, in a yeah, cap was. bond and parametric form. Yeah. Um, and it's never really got to the scale that I thought it would. But do you think with data and better technology and things, we're now, is this the start of something much, much bigger? Yeah, yeah, Steve. I mean, uh, 1997, I, I find it, I, I sort of, I, I approximate this to say 20 to 25 years, um, uh, which is frank, which is funnily enough that the, the same uh, lag or time lag that some of my capital, uh, some of my um, investment banking friends think the insurance market is behind investment banking. But mm. um, what, what, we, what we've got here is, um, it, from my perspective, I thought this, you know, pretty early, pretty early on. 
uh, perhaps it was what um, reading uh, articles in Artemis actually, but pretty early on in my 18 year career, um, I, I heard about cap bonds and I thought, oh, okay, um, that, that, that makes the convergence of insurance and capital markets pretty inevitable, I would have thought. Um, you know, let's just see how this goes. So, you know, a few uh, uh, blog views later, maybe hundreds of blog views later, um, I saw you know, people banging on about the complexity of reinsurance risk. And this seems to hold water to some extent because, uh, you know, risk situations are unique. You know, every business and individual is different, la, la, la. But, but the fact is that the reinsurance transactions themselves are not that complicated. You've got, you've got a capital deployment, you've got a premium payment, uh, potential claims and a capital release or not if the capital, if, if uh, the, the layer has been total. So these are, these are just four cash flows and they're relatively easily easy to model uh, in R or an equivalent programming language of your choice. Um, now, now global capital markets uh, were thought to be 120 times the size of uh, global insurance markets in 2018. You've got McKinsey talking about global capital markets totaling or valued at being about $300 trillion. Now, I know we've had COVID since, but as a sort of heuristic or as a sort of benchmark, it, it's effective. Because if you compare that with what Deloitte said in 2018, Q1 2018, about the value of insurance markets amounting to $2.5 trillion. And think, oh, okay, well, the insurance market isn't really mutually exclusive. This complexity may actually be driven by the kind of smoke and mirrors that people in both markets use to dress one up against the other. And, and really, reinsurance as a transaction, if you look at bring it down to cash flows, is, is compar you know, very, very similar to a debt capital finance contract. I, I worked, used to work uh, with, with Price Forbes for, uh, for a little while, and I experimented by, uh, by taking a, a reinsurance contract, an example of a real reinsurance contract, and, and, and writing it as a discounted cash flow forecast with those four cash flows I talked about. And I uh, presented this to one of the, I think the seventh largest hedge fund in the world, who based in yeah, New York and St. James's, and said to this person, yeah, I, I, I anonymized all the names of the cash flows. I just put the dates, I showed it as a time series, the dates and the cash flows in a number of scenarios, and said to this, this hedge fund manager, would you, would you finance this? And he looked at it and sort of said, it's got a 20% IRR, James. What's the, what's the trick? Is, where, <laughs> is there equity and risk involved? I mean, what is this? This is, of course I would do this. He's a debt capital investor. Uh, yeah, even, even their uh, most distressed debt funds don't see those kind of yields. And, and I said, right. yeah, no, this is a, this is actually a bog standard reinsurance <laughs> transaction. And he said, okay, find me more, find me a lot more of these. So uh, you know, how much capital do you need? In this case, it was you know, 50 million US dollars. It was excess of a captive retention. And, um, and that really helped validate my plan, my you know, hypothesis about the, the movement, the transition, the, the collateralization on a large scale that could be possible here. Mm. No, that's really interesting, actually. And it also, <laughs> that kind of explains why a risk advisory is quite a good uh, person to sit in the middle of these deals, because people like hedge funds really do understand risk in yeah. terms of the financial risk and the risk of losing their money. And they're very happy to put money into initiatives that have cash flows that deliver promising returns if everything goes right, but they do mm -hmm. need the support of Steve, Steve, you're, you, you're totally right. We've got a, we're a team that built, you know, starts with a hypothesis about a customer segment and a risk return profile. And then we present that to an investor. They don't have the resource to invest in underwriters. They don't have the, the resource to, to do the analytics. They look at our, our proposal and say yes or no in about, you know, 10, 20 minutes. I mean, that, that's a world away from standing at Q's in Lloyd's of London, as I did in the early part of my career, waiting for Syndicate 510. A few people might know who I'm referring to. And I, I waited there for two and a half days before I got a you know, valuable answer from the 
active underwriter, which was great, but it was, it was, it was a proposal for conditional capital. Yeah, not, not necessarily, yeah, capital that could be called upon in the, yeah, in the event of a loss, not, not actual capital that uh, hedge funds are using to collateralize the structures we're talking about. So, mm. yeah, Artemis reporting on um, the, the nascent cap bonds new world and um, yeah, growth in that we've seen, we, we, we're now seeing really contemporary pressure on insurance businesses, uh, which are, you know, not, not making huge profits uh, at all by any means in these times, looking to, to, looking to uh, deleverage in operational terms, these, these, these businesses, that's solvency too. So what we, what we, whether you like it or not, there's tremendous pressure on insurance carriers, reinsurers to, uh, to find different operating models. We think we've got one. We're, we're not a, we're not a broking team. We, we're an appointed representative of a Lloyd's broking team. Uh, it, it may make sense for us to get a, a full insurer license in the future. And it may make sense for us to, uh, to buy a broker or invest in a insurance Lloyd's broking uh, license too. But, but right now, um, I, I'm, I'm not really sure which way it's going to go. We can demonstratively create value for the, the, the clients we're working with by reducing total cost of risk. We can demonstratively generate risk-adjusted returns for the capital providers we've got. And so whether you look at this like a cork being popped <laughs> or, or, or the start of an avalanche, uh, I think it's, this is something this is the start of much something much bigger. The collateralization of facultative reinsurance is representative of something that's much bigger. At least that's what I'm uh, that's what I'm explaining to venture capital teams in my inquiry for a Series A growth equity fundraise right now. <laughs> sure. And when when you talk about these capital providers, I mean you, you mentioned hedge funds, but what what kind of investors do you think this is going to be appealing to? Well, like Steve, first caveat. It's important to note here that it, it's unlawful to uh, solicit capital from certain parties in certain parts of the world. And so we've had to be really careful about uh, how we manage this, how we go about doing this. But, but this said, we've spoken to uh, listen, a, a wide variety of, of hedge fund, of pension fund, of ILS fund investors, um, as well as teams in top investment banks uh, and family offices. Uh, about our special reinsurance situations uh, strategy, and, and this research has um, has given us a really a real sense that the, the negative yields uh, in conventional bond uh, markets and COVID-driven uncertainty in equity markets mean that investors are like crying out for yield. They're crying out mm. for new asset classes, as this is, and they're astonished by the rates online charged for primary facultative reinsurance layers. Mm. Yeah, because there's there's plenty of other things that they're putting their money into, which can go to zero overnight and pay like much, much crypto. less. Like crypto. Wow. But allegedly. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole other discussion. Um, and what about on the sort of ESG front? Of it's, a, it's a big trend, obviously, now in insurance, reinsurance, and particularly in ILS, and investors are very focused on it. It's, it's, I mean, I guess... It, with this view of being a niche risk advisor and able to actually find specialized verticals within insurance opportunities, do you think there's an opportunity to actually create something that really is very ESG compliant? Yeah, yeah, we are. Listen, um, ESG agendas are very, very prominent with in, in investor teams right now, and um, things are really only moving in one direction. Um, but this, this maybe isn't quite the unique selling point that for, for ILS because like ILS is about uncorrelated returns from well diversified portfolios of underlying exposures you know th these are all highly sought after already you know, the, S the SG uh, box to be ticked is fantastic as well but but we, we, we think the ILS challenge isn't really a supply side or can you get the capital challenge uh, we think it more as a a challenge of identifying specific uh, customer segments and then originating modeling and structuring sessions in a way you know, that, that creates value for, for both the buyer by reducing total costs of risk and, and for capital providers by generating risk-adjusted returns on capital. 
Mm. Yeah, no, that, that that's my feeling too. That you you can't exclude your way to ESG compatible portfolios. You've actually got to start from the bottom up and originate them. So that requires expertise and finding the it. right opportunity. Um, and so finally, um, I know you're a, a bit of a technology geek yourself. And you've, you've dabbled in R, which is something I've also dabbled with <laughs> over okay. the years. Um, interested to know what, what, how are you applying technology to your special situations, Ron? Um, well, listen, facultative underwriters typically use two to three Excel based pricing models. Um, but we, we got a data science team to, to help us to code five traditional reinsurance pricing models that were previously in Excel into R, the statistical programming language. And um, this means that we have a really good starting point, a supervised learning algorithm, which we call DSVP. Uh, we use this to reduce total cost of risk for clients, generate risk adjusted returns for clients and uh, for capital providers and analyze and structure sessions of risk to the special situations fund. And then also to the, the other strategies that we're working on too, working with uh, a few other London broking houses currently on, on uh, transfer of communicable disease risk that's been outlawed by a famous market near my, where my office is. Um, the, at the next stage for Agile, um, we're going to be investing in a uh, investing in DSVP and building an unsupervised learning model. Now, this means that rather rather than relying on you know, age-old underwriting hunches, heuristics, and feelings about risk, we can use machine learning algorithms to explore data, risk data, find patterns, and evaluate risk drivers. Um, so, to any uh, interested VC teams out there, we're looking at unsupervised learning algorithms is driving big profits with big data with small risk advisory teams. <laughs> no, and that's a great thesis to have as well, because that's that's the whole point of it, embracing this type of technology now is to actually do more, much, much more with much, much less, and to do much more in a much more accurate way as well. So that's a good, good story, James. Look, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Uh, it was very interesting to learn about what you're doing, and I'm sure if anybody wants to reach out, they'll they'll now be able to find you. So yeah, um, they. I I have listen listen, Steve. I we invested not very much money, but in early weeks in these incredible business cards, and they are they're very high quality business cards. They're thick. They look very smart. They're very well designed. Yet we we're, we're in a world where uh, we're communicating and doing this uh, this this interview on zoom and i'm not sure i'm going to be able to sort of dish any of these out particularly but you can obviously look to uh, the slightly less traditional means of uh, a media in getting in contact with us and and do so if you're a broking team with a client with a serious risk problem that's difficult to finance traditionally and do so if you're an insurer or reinsurer a risk carrier or captive and and you're looking at uh, a, a challenge where you've got a risk in a that's being interpreted as being in a in a payback year, uh, and it's difficult to to finance in in other ways because ultimately this is a this is the the, the start of a really interesting phase for uh, for interaction between insurance capital markets. Great. Thanks so much, James. Really appreciate it. Nice to talk to you virtually, and hopefully we will get to meet up at some point in the not too Absolutely. future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's do it. Thanks, James. Bye. Bye.